This is the greatest day in the history of Southern Baptist Convention life. You are about 20 minutes ahead of schedule, and they just told me, take all the time I want. <laughs> wow, that is the greatest thing that's ever happened. All right, well, I will then. Uh, well, maybe not all the time. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Colossians chapter 3, where in just a moment I'll be reading the passage of Scripture that's going to be the foundation for today's message, Colossians chapter 3. And while you're turning there, I'll acknowledge that I've been asked to give a seminary report this afternoon, and so I won't do that now, but I would like to just say thank you for your longtime gifts through the cooperative program that have made Gateway Seminary possible. Our school was founded in 1944 and adopted by the SBC in 1950, and we've been receiving cooperative program funds since then. And today, uh, Gateway Seminary is the 10th largest seminary in North America, and that would not have been possible were we depending only on the support of Southern Baptists in the West. There just aren't enough of us. But thank God for a national movement called the Cooperative Program, which has fueled us financially for these decades and made such a significant seminary possible for Southern Baptists on the West Coast. And I'd also like to say thank you for the last uh, at least two trustees that you've sent to us. Uh, for the 20 years almost that I've been president, our trustees have been Greg Byman from Indiana and now Steve Davidson from Indiana. And I want to thank you for both of these men. Uh, Steve is currently rising in leadership on our board. He chairs our academic services committee and serves on our executive committee and also on our personnel committee. And so thank you for sending us uh, such godly leadership and such competent, wise leadership to serve on our board of trustees. Thank you very much. Your theme is the now. And so I reflected on what is happening now in the church's of the Southern Baptist Convention that is perhaps unique as I look back over now 40 years of leadership as a pastor and denominational executive. What stands out the most to me in the last two years has been the incredible level of conflict in our churches. For example, a pastor recently called me prominent African-American pastor in the Western United States. And he said, Dr. Orge, I need some counsel. Two of my elders are coming to church every Sunday morning wearing Make America Great Again hats. And it has created some Sunday morning worship service conflict. Another pastor in the West called me. He's Korean. Dr. Orge, I need help. Last Friday night in our elders meeting, we were discussing some of the pressing social issues in our community, and two of my elders got in a fist fight, and we had to separate them, and it has torn our church to pieces. And then, and then a pastor from the Northwest called. And said, as you know, Dr. Orge, I have some family members that are highly susceptible to illness. And so because of COVID, we're being extra careful about them. And I went to church wearing a mask. And one of my members said, if I ever walk in this building again and see you wearing a mask, it'll be the last time you ever see me in this church. I said, well, what about my family members? He said, I don't care. I don't ever want to see that on you again. And then, pastor in Oklahoma, when I was preaching at a conference there, asked if he could talk with me over lunch, and he said, we were in a larger building, but during COVID, because of smaller attendance and the need to broadcast our services, we moved into a chapel on our, on our uh, campus, a smaller location. And in the move, we were mostly concerned about getting the technology and the social distancing right. And after a few Sundays in the new facility, one of our men said, I want to know why you didn't move the American flag into the temporary space. And the pastor said, well, honestly, it was probably just an oversight. We had so many other things we were thinking about. And he said, well, I want it moved in there, and I want it moved in there now. And the pastor said, well, we can, we can work on that. But then he asked the question, why are you so angry, and why is this such a pressing issue? We, we have the cross on prominent display right behind the pulpit. 
And this brother said, because the flag and the cross mean the same thing. And the pastor realized he had a much, diff, more, a much uh, more difficult problem to address. And ultimately, a number of families left the church over this conflict. Brothers, sisters, we are arguing over politicians, social justice issues, masks, and the flag. We are dividing up right now over all kinds of things, and it is creating distraction from sharing the gospel and division in the fellowship of God's people. And because of that, it is diminishing our impact and our capacity to make a difference in our world. And so I want to talk with you about the need of the hour right now, which is unity in Baptist churches. But more than just preach about the need for it, I want to show you from a text of Scripture how practically we can live out the unity we have in Jesus Christ. So in order to see that, join with me in Colossians chapter 3, breaking into the text at verse 11. The Bible says, In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you are also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This passage of Scripture begins with a theological declaration of the unity we have in Jesus Christ. Look with me at verse 11. It reads like a litany. In Christ, it says, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. In these four couplets, there are great uh, uh, issues overcome in Jesus Christ. There's no Greek or Jew, meaning there are no racial differences in Jesus Christ. No circumcision or uncircumcision, meaning there are no religious differences in Jesus Christ. Barbarian or Scythian, meaning there are no cultural differences in Jesus Christ. Slave or free, there are no legal status differences in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, all of these things have been overcome when we find ourselves in Christ. No racial differences, no cultural differences, no religious differences, no legal differences. We are one in Jesus Christ. And after this litany of these four couplets, he doubles down and says in the next verse, but we are also God's chosen ones. That's borrowing language from the Old Testament where God has always had a people. God has a chosen people, and the people who are reading this were well acquainted with that and the centuries of that designation. And now Paul writes and says, you are God's chosen people, elevating our value by giving us that title. And then look at the next phrase. He says, you are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Now, if you come to Gateway Seminary and you take a theology class, the professor will eventually lecture on the doctrine of God. And when he lectures on the doctrine of God, he will say that God's character can be understood in two broad categories. God is holy and God is love. Say those words with me. Holy love. God is holy and God is love. And in those descriptors of his character, so much of the rest of the theology of God can be explained. Now look back at the text. You are God's chosen ones. And how are you described? Holy and dearly loved. Meaning that you have the nature or the essence of God within you and by who you are, you are revealing God to people around you because just like God is holy and loved, you are holy and loved in him. Now this is the picture that's being described of us. 
We are one in Jesus Christ. All differences have been overcome. All racial, religious, uh, cultural, and legal status differences have been abolished. We are one in Jesus Christ. And we all, every one of us, have value in him because we are his chosen ones. And every one of us has a new identity in him. We actually even represent God to each other and to the world around us because we are holy and loved. My friends, that is a dramatic picture of what it means to be in Christ. But our world doesn't want to act this way. And sadly, often our churches don't either. We still want to put people on a pecking order, give people a rank, treat some people as more important than others, and have relationships with some but not the others. That's the way our world works. And frankly, sometimes we like it. I know I do. Because I work on the West Coast and have for more than 30 years, and I also work with and for the Southern Baptist Convention, I frequently fly back and forth across the United States. Frequently. And because of that, I have almost 2 million miles on American Airlines. They love me. Prior to COVID, on two occasions, the pilot came from the cockpit back to my seat and said, Mr. Orge, thank you for flying American Airlines. We appreciate your loyalty to our company. If anything I can do for you or any one of my staff, please let me know while you're on my aircraft. I felt pretty good that day. (laughs) I tell you, I felt like somebody now. The pilot came back and talked to me. Two million miles. That'll get you that kind of treatment. When I'm flying American and they cancel my flight, frequently my phone will ring before the announcement is made and they'll say, Mr. George, we, we're canceling your flight. We want you to know we've already rebooked you on another one. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. That feels pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. Get this. I always buy the cheapest ticket possible. That's what we do when we manage my expense account at Gateway Seminary. We buy the cheapest ticket possible. of the time last year, they upgraded that cheap ticket to first class. (laughs) And I took every one of them. (laughs) Walked right up there to the front like I was somebody. I like it when people treat me special and different. But occasionally I have to fly a different airline. My wife knows the code. I will call her and say, I am about to board, aboard a plane with the unwashed masses. <laughs> and I'll be sitting back there across from the bathroom and next to the screaming baby, just like all the rest of the people. You know what I'm saying? This is the way our world works. We give out special privileges to certain people, and we treat some people better than other people. Aren't you glad that has all been abolished in Jesus Christ? That that is not the way the church works. That is not the way the denomination works. That is not the way our seminary works. We are one in Jesus Christ, chosen people, holy and loved, representing God to each other and to the world around us. That is our standing in Jesus Christ. Well... How do you make that real? Paul then writes the lessons in the next few verses about how to live this out. Let's keep going. Picking up in verse 12, he says, As God's chosen ones, holy and dearly dearly loved, put on. Let's stop right there. Put on. This is a word that could also be used outside the Bible to describe getting dressed in the morning. Put on means to don or to wear or to clothe yourself with. Now, this morning I got up and I put on this shirt for two or three reasons. First of all, uh, I wanted to wear something that would represent respect to you as I preach, so I put on this shirt. Second, I wanted to ride for the brand. I wanted Golden Gate on my chest so that nobody would doubt where I came from when I'm here at your meeting this week. Third, I put this shirt on because you do not want to look at old man body. (laughs) It's just not that appealing. I put on these clothes so I would be presentable to you, represent something to you, and be respectful of you. That's what this word means, put on something. 
wear it. What do you put on? Well, look at these words. It says, because you have this unity in, in Jesus Christ, put on some things. Wear them like a, like a garment. Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put on these qualities. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It means get up in the morning as a believer in Jesus Christ and say to yourself as part of your preparation for the morning, I'm getting dressed today with certain character qualities that I'm going to demonstrate to other believers. Now, sometimes in the Bible, in order to really understand its meaning, we need to delve down into what's called the etymology of the words. We need to dig down deep and find out their Greek or Hebrew origin. We need to find out how they're used outside the Bible. We need to see the intricacies of the word's design and how it's put together and then how it's used in Scripture. And there is certainly opportunity to do that and need to do that in some texts. This is not one of those. Listen, brothers and sisters, we know what compassion looks like. We know kindness when we see it. We understand humility when it's demonstrated. We know what gentleness and patience are. Listen, my friends, the problem is not in defining the words. The problem is in doing them. It is making the decision every day to act this way to each other. In person, on the phone, and on social media. We act this way to one another. We put on these qualities, and this is how we represent ourselves to each other in our interpersonal relationships. We put on these five qualities, but there's more. Drop down to verse 14, you find the word put on again. It says in verse 14, above all, put on what? Love. Put on love. Some of you look like you're old enough to remember this song. Do you remember an older Vacation Bible School song? If you remember the lyrics, you finish it for me. His banner over me is? A lot of you remember that song. That song is based on this verse. His banner over me is love. Put on love. It says, above all, put on love. So here's the picture. Get up in the morning and put on compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Put on those qualities and then pick up the banner of love like a flag and fly it over your life. And walk into relationships every day wearing these qualities and waving the banner of love over everything you're going to do in every relationship with every other believer. Now, here's what you're thinking. Okay, I get that. I get that. And I will do that because the Bible says to do it. But here's my question. What about all those Christians who are not here this morning that are not going to act that way back to me? I mean, I'm all for putting on these qualities and waving the banner of love and moving into relationships as you're describing, but what happens when people who were not here today and didn't hear the sermon don't do it back to me? Well, the text answers that question. Let's keep reading. Verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. In other words, when people don't treat you like you're treating them, what do you do in response? Two things. First, bear with them. And second, forgive them. What does it mean to bear with someone who's not treating you appropriately? Well, my mother taught me this when I was a child because it was one of her favorite phrases, a translation of the phrase bearing with. My mother would use the phrase put up with. Now, I know this will surprise you, but when I was a child, I had some annoying habits. Three really stood out. And number one, I chewed my fingernails constantly. Number two, I, I picked my nose regularly. And third, I talked constantly. Now, I have overcome two of these problems and turned the third one into a career choice, okay? <laughs> It, it, it worked out pretty well. <laughs> but when I was a child, my mother did almost anything you can imagine to stop me from chewing my fingernails and picking my nose. 
She put cinnamon oil on my fingertips. She wrapped my fingers in Band-Aids. She did all kinds of things. And as a little boy, I struggled with these bad habits. And my mother would often say while she was working with these various things that she came up with to try to stop these habits, I don't know how I'm going to keep putting up with you. That's what it means to bear with somebody. It means to put up with them while they're annoying. To put up with them while they're annoying. You already know this, but have you observed how churches attract annoying people? (laughs) God doesn't give you this prepackaged supply of perfect Christians to work with. And they can be annoying, and as this verse says, grievous. And your responsibility to maintain this unity we're preaching about today is to bear with them. Put up with them. While they grow up to implement the first part of the verse like you're trying to do. And then the second thing you do, it says it, forgive them. Now this is some of the hardest part of the preaching because the qualifier of the forgiving is actually also included in the verse. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, how much? Just as the Lord has forgiven you. Now let's get real. The Lord has forgiven me a lot. How about you? And so the measure of the standard of my forgiveness of grievous, annoying people who don't treat me like I treat them, the standard is the forgiveness to the extent that God has forgiven me me that is a high standard brothers and sisters so here's what we've learned so far what we've learned so far is we have unity in Jesus Christ we're highly valued and we represent God to each other and to our world now we have to act like it how do we do that we get up every day and we put on some character qualities and we say, I'm going to treat people a certain way today and fly the banner of love over my life and all that I do interpersonally in relationship. And when people don't treat me like I'm treating them, I'm going to bear with them and I'm going to forgive them. But now you're thinking, but what about the really hard ones? What about those crescendo moments, those difficult situations that arise in a meeting or in a service or in a relationship or a counseling moment? What about those situations that come up where it's just like tension-filled moment of decision point? Well, let's back to the text. The next verse helps us. Verse 15, it says, And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts. Now, the word rule is an interesting word. It could also be translated officiate your heart or referee your heart or umpire your heart. Now, for 25 years, believe it or not, my hobby was umpiring youth baseball up and down the West Coast. And I umpired a lot of youth baseball for 25 years uh, from Little League through high school. In fact, I've umpired state championship tournaments in Washington, Oregon, and uh, California for every age group from 10-year-olds to 18-year-olds. State tournaments. I umpired one night on ESPN. I umpired third base in a game that sent a team to the Little League World Series. And do you know what I did? I'm going to show it to you. Here it is. I did this twice in the game. Time. but I did it on ESPN (laughs) twice. Yeah, that game ended two to zero and the two that went by third base didn't even stop to say hello. They just kept on going. I, I stood out there for six, I stood out there for two and a half hours and said time twice. Umpire. Now, Through that 25 years of umpiring and through some other connections in baseball, long story short, I got connected to Major League Baseball umpires and particularly to a ministry entitled Calling for Christ. Ministry was founded in 2002. It's a directed, small ministry directed specifically to professional umpires in North America. 
And uh, we've baptized over 40 of those guys since they started their ministry. I, I'm on their teaching team every year at the retreat. I co counsel and mentor with the leaders of that organization who are themselves professional umpires that you watched, by the way, on television in the National League and American League Championship Series. Both those crew chiefs are on the board of CFC. Fine Christian man. What is it that motivates an umpire while they're out there working? Oh, you're thinking, oh, they're motivated by the crowd, you know, but they don't want to. No, no, they're not. You know, well, they're motivated by the, by the manager. They manage the shoes on a little bit, and they'll, they'll, they'll give a call, or they'll take a call. No, they're not. Well, they're motivated for makeup calls. They make a bad call, they're going to give you a call. No, they're not. You know that Major League umpires actually wear a t -sh an undershirt under their uniform that has something embroidered over the heart? You know what it says? Guardians of the game. Guardians of the game. What motivates the best umpires is the integrity of the moment, the integrity of the game, getting it right in an eye blink. Now, you, with all that in mind, let's go back to the text. It says, above, it says, and let the peace of Christ, let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts, umpire your hearts, make the call, referee the moment. Let what make the call, not being a guardian of the game, but let what make the call? Let the peace of Christ, what? Make the call. So in those tension-filled moments when things are really building to a crescendo and there's a real question about what needs to be done in that moment, let peace make the call. In other words, whatever will lead to peace, let that be the decision you make. But now some of you are asking this legitimate question. Are you telling me peace at any price? And the answer, based on the theme of this message, may surprise you, but the answer to the question, does this mean peace at any price, is no. Now, in order to talk about this part of the message, we've got to step outside this text for a moment. Now, all of you know that every text of Scripture was written to a context and to a particular people, and in most cases, there is no one text that incorporates everything that needs to be said about a particular subject. That's why we study the whole Bible to preach a message. The emphasis of this text is on Christian unity and the importance of it. But there's at least three times in the New Testament where we are actually told to break the peace. I'll just mention these. One, we break the peace when there's serious doctrinal error. In Galatians chapter 2, for example, the Bible says that Paul writing, I confronted Peter to his face because Peter was teaching something that was contradicting the gospel is by grace alone through faith alone without any part of human work attached. Serious doctrinal error. You have to break the peace. Second, you break the peace when there is blatant, unrepentant immorality. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You remember the story. A man was having a sexual relationship with his stepmother, and Paul said, you are letting this go on in the church. Stop it. Don't let that go on in your church. There's a third example, and this one is not as well known, so I'm going to read the text to you. So just listen now. This is a text in Titus chapter 3, and that is we are to break the peace with people who give us frivolous arguments. Listen to what Titus, what was written to Titus. Titus 3 verse 9 says, Avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, and disputes about the law because they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a divisive person after a first and second warning, for you know that such a person has gone astray and is sinning. Now, I have a reputation, people tell me, for not engaging much in a lot of the frivolous debate that goes on in our country and denomination, and I don't. You know why? Because I take this verse seriously. When someone says something to me, I'll engage with them twice, and then we just move on. They can keep yelling all they want, I'm moving on. They can keep tweeting all they want, I moved on. You say, you just ignore them? <laughs> Believe it or not, I do. I just move on. Now, this verse doesn't say that you ignore everybody. It says, what, after one or two conversations, right? 
So I engage people who disagree with me and who raise frivolous arguments and who want to argue about things that I don't really think are all that important. I'll engage with them once. I might even engage with them twice. But after that, I say, brother, we don't see eye to eye on this. We just both need to move on. And that's where it has to end. I broke the peace with that brother, but I have to move on from it and just leave it where it is. This perpetual arguing over things that don't really matter is not productive. Now, if it's a serious doctrinal matter or blatant immorality, it's got to be stopped. But if it's a frivolous argument, you move on from it. But don't these examples even come back to prove the point of this message? Why do you confront doctrinal error so you can rid your congregation of it and get back to peace? Why do you confront blatant immorality so you can remove it from your congregation and get back to peace? Why do you move on from a divisive person who won't stop talking because you have no time to keep engaging that because of the disruption? The disruption that it's bringing to your ministry and relationships so you can get back to what? Peace. So even when you break the peace, the point is to what? (laughs) Get back to the peace. So we've learned so far. We are unified in Jesus Christ. We practice that unity by putting on certain qualities in interpersonal relationships. We bear with and forgive people who don't treat us the way we treat them. When crescendo moments of difficulty come, we choose the peace. Unless it's one of these permissible areas where we have to break the peace, and then we break the peace for the purpose of getting what? Back to the peace. And then there's one more thing here. One more thing that contributes to unity, and I almost skipped it when I started studying this passage, but I just couldn't get away from it. Last phrase of verse 15, and be thankful. Now, in in Scripture, there are no throwaway lines. Every word is inspired. We know that. So this is not just a tag on. This is something significant, and be thankful. So I've reflected a good bit on how does this fit into the flow of of this theme and this idea that Paul is developing for us here, and be thankful. In the context of interpersonal relationships, when you have put on these qualities, demonstrated them carefully, uh, bearing with and forgiving those who disagree with you or who come against you in a different way, and then you have practiced peace and you've broken the peace only when you had to so that you could get back to the peace as quickly as possible, how does being thankful for people like this and for situations like this contribute to unity? Well, I'll just give you this example from our marriage. My wife and I have been married for 42 years, and we're going to teach on that in the next hour. 42 years. Now, now don't react to this, but just listen. In 42 years, I know now all of my wife's weaknesses. Now, now just stay with me. I know she knows mine. That's, we're, not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about just this point of peace. And when I know everything my wife does that annoys me, I, I know what she does that, that I think, what is she thinking? I, I know these things after 42 years. And if I choose to focus on those three or four things, constantly churning on those, it does not produce peace in our relationship. But if I choose to focus on the thousand things my wife does well and the contribution she's made to my life and the contribution she's made to the lives of others and the impact she's made in ministry, and I focus myself on being thankful for all the good in her life instead of the two or three things that annoy me, then I produce unity and peace in our relationship. Are you tracking with me here? Look, there are 10,000 things wrong with your church, but there's a million things right. Look, you can find the people in your circle of influence that are just annoying and difficult and problematic, but you can find a whole lot more that are the best people God ever made, and he let you be a part of their lives and have an impact in your life. Look, every now and then somebody sends me a mean email, and I think, what in the world is this person doing? They fire me up on social media. They attack me here and there. And then I walk into the chapel at Gateway Seminary, and I see all these people who've come together in Jesus Christ, and I just say, and I get to be among all of these. Thank you, God, that this is really what it's all about. And be thankful is not a throwaway line. And be thankful is the capstone of all of this. If you really want unity and peace, get your focus off the cranky ones and get your attention and focus on the many people that are in your life that are enriching and positive and supportive and good and healthy and wholesome who've made a difference in your life all along the way. And be thankful. Well, to close, 
let's shift the attention just a little bit. We have unity in Jesus Christ. We practice it by putting into place all these things I've said. But now in verse 16, there's a shift in the text. It shifts away from personal relationships to corporate activities that produce peace. Excuse me, that produce unity. Two of them. First, verse 16, worship. Second, verse 17, service. You facilitate unity in your church by getting them to do two things together. Worship and serve. Now, not all of you in this room are under 30. But if I were speaking to all of you that were under 30, I would tell you unity is not built by sitting in a coffee shop talking about theology. Unity is built when you go into a neighborhood that needs Jesus and start knocking on doors and telling people about the Lord. And that person you're with, you will have a bond grow with that person that you're out doing something with. Unity is built when you go out and do a mission trip together. Unity is built when you go out and do something uh, in service like disaster relief. Unity is built when you go and clean up somebody's yard in, or somebody's house in your community that's been hit by a disaster. Unity is built when you get somebody as your partner and you go out and you start visiting the homeless, visiting the shut-ins, visiting people in need in your community. When you... It says here, do things in the name of Jesus together. It facilitates unity. Look, the people in my life that I am the closest to are not the people that have sat around with me and talked about unity. It's the people who've gotten up and done something with me that we put our blood, sweat, and tears on the line together. We prayed together. We held hands together. We held on to each other together. And we made it through something together. And now we stand back and we say to each other, we are brothers in Jesus because we were able to do that together. And the same thing with worshiping together. What is it about worship that produces unity? It is calling us together in the presence of God and letting him speak to us, change us, transform us, and then see that happening in the life of other people so we get to celebrate baptism together and celebrate repentance together and celebrate life change together and celebrate marriage together and celebrate funerals together and celebrate together God working among all of us together at the same time. This passage is so practical, Pastor, to facilitate unity in your church, call them to worship and call them to service. Don't call them to meetings to talk about how we can be more unified. Get them worshiping God and serving others and unity will result. So the need of the day, the now, is unity in our relationships with other believers, expressed in our families, expressed in our churches, expressed in our convention, and we're going to get there when we recognize we are one in Jesus Christ, all barriers have been overcome. We can act like it by putting on these certain qualities described in this text, marching under the banner of love. Bearing with and forgiving people who don't treat us like we're treating them. Letting peace make the call. And when peace can't be held up in the moment, break the peace. But only so you can get back to the peace. And change your perspective. Off the few negative voices in your life to being thankful for the many positive influences and impacts believers make in your life. Shift your focus off the few negative things in the life of a person who's annoying onto the positive aspects of what you see God doing in and through them. And then as a leader, lead your church to worship and to serve. And every time someone raises a distraction to either one of those things, call them back to worship and service. And watch God facilitate unity. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing me to preach this message today and to live some of it out at Gateway Seminary. Thank you for placing me in such a diverse environment with so many different kinds of people and calling us to oneness in you. And thank you for giving us the grace to live it out day by day. Father, thank you for teaching me about dealing with annoying people, to learn how to bear with them and forgive them. Father, Thank you for showing me that sometimes I do have to break the peace, and I pray these brothers and sisters here will take the, have the courage to do that as well. But Father, I pray most of all that you would give every person here who's a church leader the personal discipline to put this message into practice, and then the discipline to go home 
and lead their church to worship you and serve you, believing that unity will result from those activities as you promise here in your word. God, increase our unity that our witness might be more powerful, that we might be more effective as your people, and that we might uh, model what it means to be your church in this generation. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.